Anyhow, I just wanted to start off you know, with a quick anecdote. Um, so there's a farmer, and he has these two horses. Uh, no. No one? OK, anyhow, I'm Adam. Uh, this is Scott Gonzalez. He's uh, the development lead of jQuery UI and basically doer of all things, except for the things that Corey also does not do. Um, <laughs> they, oh, man. Uh, and then Clark. Uh, is also here as a member of the infrastructure team, and he's been building some pretty cool stuff that I think you'll also be hearing about tomorrow. Um, but what, would hear, what we're here to talk to you about today is uh, our infrastructure, the fact that it's open source, and how that relates to you, members of the jQuery community. Um, so who here loves docs.jQuery.com? Really? <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> API.jQuery.com, right? That's the good. Docs.jQuery.com is that old wiki that there's now only three pages you can access on because we've <laughs> redirected almost all of them. Keep it uh, but if you're looking for a tutorial on how to track mouse events, it's, <laughs> you got like a day or two left. Uh, <laughs> um, so obviously, once upon a time, we had docs.jQuery.com. It was, it was uh, the first documentation. And the idea of that was like, Let's make our docs into a wiki, because a great way to get the community involved is have a wiki. Anyone can edit. And then it turns out that when you just let anyone edit, anyone can spam um, anything. And it turns out it's like, how do I bind an event? And the answer is like, buy these batteries. Uh, <laughs> uh, so our solution was obviously to turn off user, user registration. So you know, people wanted to help with docs bugs. and they couldn't sign up for the wiki, and they're like, uh, there's no registration link. And we're like, you got it. There is no registration link. Um, oh, this, this little, got this guy. Uh, so as it turns out, um, people who were already signed up could log into the wiki and do whatever they needed to do. And if you uh, knew someone who had permission to edit the wiki, then they could set you up with an account. So instead of just being able to submit changes, you had to like deal with like this long process of kind of meeting the right people and ingratiating yourself and proving that you actually did deserve uh, access to the wiki because you weren't going to try and you know, put batteries on there. Uh, so it's a really, it was a really bad process. Also, what sucks about the wiki, what sucked about the wiki for us is this sucks, because who wants to edit HTML in, inside of like escaped XML inside of a text area? The answer is. Nobody does. Uh, so we realized that we had to change this whole, this whole deal. Uh, we realized our API documentation had to be structured. It probably shouldn't be in a wiki anymore. Um, so what we did was uh, we converted the docs to XML, because that's like structured and going to be great. Uh, so what do we do with that XML? Bam, put it into WordPress. Pew! Oh. Uh, turns out this sucks also. Uh, this is XML inside of a rich text editor. Um, as everyone knows, the rich in rich text editor stands with rich with bugs. Um, bam! I'm just going to say bam if you don't laugh. So, uh, <laughs> um, And then another thing that sucks about this is it's impossible to keep track of all this uh, because you don't know when there's something that's broken because you can't file an issue. It's just a WordPress site. And there's, there's a lot of things that CMSs and wikis both have in common. So you need to get an account. It sucks to edit. There's not, the changes aren't actually versioned uh, in, the sense that in the same way that code is. Um, you end up with really important, volatile content. The canonical source of it is this one database. And it needs to be backed up, which may or may not happen. As I was saying, there's no issue tracking. And then if you have you know, a bunch of different WordPress installs, and then like a Drupal site or two, and then like some static sites, custom, a couple custom PHP sites, um, you end up duplicating a, an absurd amount of CSS and markup, and it's completely unmaintainable. And then if someone comes along and they're like, man, you know what jQuery is missing? Pastels. I think that's the main thing that jQuery needs, is the websites to all be pastels. They can't suggest that, because there's no place for them to make the edit or suggest it. There's only one place where the site lives. So obviously, duplicating things twice is really bad. You know, Don't repeat yourself, wet, write everything twice. 
Duplicating things 20 times is bad, 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 bad. Bam. Oh, man. It's auto bam. It's the bam has be anyway. So when things become unmaintainable, but they cease to be maintained. Um, we had stagnation all over the place. Uh, docs edits were just like lingering, and markup changes were lingering, and just nothing was happening. So we were like, we have to make a change. So obviously we're like, yo, let's make a mad fresh redesign. Uh, so we did this in 2010. Um, and then chilled for a while. Because as it turns out, having a good looking comp for your do API documentation, and the, when the outcome of that comp is supposed to be redesign all the websites and make them use it, the comp is like this much. And like, I'm talking on a scale that goes to like that wall. <laughs> so um, we're like, OK, how do other open source pro wait, 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 wait. We're an open source project. Um, so what are the things that make it nice to work on jQuery? The fact that you can develop locally, you have your own sandbox, do whatever you need to do, that you have real version control, Git, uh, so on and so forth, and public issue tracking so that progress is visible, someone comes along with a problem, they actually can report it somewhere. Oh man, that would work awesome for our websites and documentation, don't you think, Scott? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so we're like, okay. This is our motto. Anyone, anywhere should be able to submit any fix or improvement, no matter how consequential or inconsequential. Uh, semicolon, people can add semicolons if they feel like they should be there. You can remove <laughs> semicolons if they feel they shouldn't. Um, you should be able to do this in your own text editor, not in like some kludgy text area. And um, we want to be able to, this works for code and for all of our sites. So. Obviously, we're like, let's put it on GitHub. That worked for jQuery, worked for jQuery UI. That was really sweet. And so we put all of these sites on GitHub. Ooh. OK. So the real question, though, is so we got it on GitHub. How did we manage it? How did we manage it, Scott? Why don't you tell us? Well, maybe I'll do that. Uh, so we had a few different requirements that Adam just, <laughs> uh, the requirements that Adam just mentioned. Um, but in addition to that, we had some, some other things, right? Like, he talked about how painful it is to edit content in XML, so now we're going to edit content in Markdown. Uh, we're going to manage it in Git for all the issue tracking that he mentioned and the version control. But uh, we're going to continue to publish via WordPress. So a lot of people ask us, why WordPress? Uh, and it turns out that there's actually a lot of stuff that WordPress solves that every single website needs to solve if you want it to be useful. Um, so things like having taxonomies, being able to search, having user management, uh, and, and something that most things don't do that WordPress does do is theme inheritance. And so these are all things that we would have to build on our own if we weren't going to use WordPress. And so using WordPress uh, makes it much, much faster, and we get the benefit of somebody else writing all this code for us. Uh, so how do you get from Git to WordPress? Uh, <laughs> This is something that we've been talking about for a while. Uh, there was a little bit of a catalyst when somebody decided to go delete batteries and everything. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was kind of in a rush trying to build this new plugin site. And I was like, well, how do I get stuff into WordPress? Um, because everyone's going to freak out about this plugin site not being up. Uh, so I figured, well, when I'm working on a website, I use a web inspector. So if I'm going to be working on a WordPress site, I'll use the WordPress inspector. And <laughs> It turns out PHP MyAdmin is not a WordPress development tool. Uh, so <laughs> this is not how you uh, figure out what's going on in WordPress. right? Like, it, it actually worked really well. I was able to go into WordPress, make some changes in the admin interface, come back here, look at what changed in the database, and then I could write some queries <laughs> that just went right into the WordPress database and made those same exact changes. And Clearly, that's how you would you know, manage a WordPress site from outside of WordPress. Uh, so about a week after I started doing this, we were in DC, and we were having a meeting, and there was a PHP meetup. And we happened to run into Andrew Nason, who's uh, one of the core WordPress developers. And we told him about what we were doing. And he told us about how we were doing it all wrong. <laughs> 
And we were doing it so wrong that he called Daryl Coopersmith, who was on the other side of the country, and said, hey, you should come here and help me explain to these guys how bad they are. <laughs> <laughs> and so Daryl got on a, a red-eye flight, uh, flew overnight, and met with us the next morning. It turned out we were and, very wrong. Yes. Very. So it turns out <laughs> that we're not the only people who want to use WordPress and not use the admin tools. So uh, WordPress has an XML RPC API, which lets you do almost everything that you can do in the admin interface. Uh, so now, you know, we got to completely rewrite all of our code. And uh, we have a sane way of interacting with WordPress now. So if you want to manage a WordPress site in JavaScript, you should use Node WordPress, and it will do the same thing for you, and it will actually work. Uh, but it turns out that's not what we want to do. We don't want to write code. We want to write Markdown. Uh, so having something that will properly manage a WordPress site is useful, but it does nothing in terms of deploying a WordPress site from Git. Uh, so what we need is a way to represent all of this code in content. And so I came up with this, uh, this idea where we could just write HTML, and then we can take all the metadata that we need to pass to WordPress, put it in a script block with some JSON, because it's a valid script, has no functionality. So if you pull up this page in your browser, uh, you would actually see all the content. The metadata just magically disappears. And it was like... Brilliant, right? So this all works. You can look at stuff. You can work on it locally. You can use your text editor. Um, but it's not actually in WordPress. So uh, you know, we, we could easily imagine how to take this content and put it in WordPress using the code. But that's only for one post. So how do we manage the entire site? So we had another brilliant idea. You just use the obvious convention of whatever, data whatever directory structure you want on your site, use that same directory structure on your file system in Git and then just sync that with WordPress, right? So if we just look through everything in the directory and say, does this post exist in WordPress? Yes, update it, no, create it. At the end, see if there's anything in WordPress that you don't have on your site or in your local directory, and just delete that from WordPress. Um, so now we have uh, you know, all the content being synced. Um, but that doesn't actually help us with resources like images, which we realized after a while. Uh, so we had this new problem, and we decided we would just write a custom XML RPC method that lets us do like this freeform upload, completely bypass all the security checks. Uh, you, we can upload pretty much any file type up to one gig now, uh, and it'll just go up there, and then we can access it. So we put all this logic into a plugin for Grunt. How many people use Grunt? Oh. Yeah, you can use it for pretty much everything. Um, so we manage all of our site deploys through Grunt. Uh, so if you want to manage a WordPress site through HTML files, then you should use Grunt WordPress. Uh, but as I said, we actually want to use Markdown, not HTML. So the last step in this process is going through all of that content transformation. So we use Marked and Highlight.js to convert from Markdown into the final HTML that will then get passed to Grunt WordPress. Uh, we also add in a couple extra features. Adam likes to be different and use YAML instead of JSON, so we have YAML support for all the metadata. Uh, we can also generate the table of contents from all the headings in the page. So if you go to like the jQuery UI upgrade guides, the table of contents at the top are all auto-generated. Um, we do the API site generation through XML files, which is like a whole nother talk. Uh, <laughs> so we still do all that XML, except now you're editing in your own text editor. Uh, and we also have other features like placeholder support. We can do partials to pull in content. Uh, so if you want to manage a WordPress site through Markdown, then Grunt jQuery content is for you. Um, it, it does sound like it's jQuery specific. It has things like uh, if you are going to build an API site, it expects our exact XML structures. But in terms of deploying uh, a normal WordPress site that's just a bunch of posts or pages, you can use Grunt jQuery content, and it will manage your entire site, and there's nothing jQuery specific in here. So now we actually have something that does what we want to do, um, and that, that's a lot of tech, right? Like there's three different modules that we built that all layer on top of each other. But in actuality, when you want to set up a site, there's very little configuration that you actually do. Because keep in mind, we have over 20 sites. Every time we stand up a new site, we don't want to be writing lots of con code or configuration. So uh, you know, you can actually use this whole architecture, get it set up in an hour, probably, and uh, be up and running on your own site. 
So uh, with all of that in place, you can actually contribute very easily. Right? Everything's in Git, managed through GitHub. Uh, so now we can see how you would use this tool and go through Grunt. So yeah, first of all, you say it's a lot of technology, but at one point, the stack was not only PHP and Node, we also had Ruby and Python. <laughs> uh, so it was like the Long Island iced tea of websites. Uh, <laughs> so what does this all actually work like uh, in terms of what does it feel like when you're just doing your development? So I don't know if you all have seen uh, contribute.jQuery.org. It's our new uh, con contribution hub, and it talks about how you do all the different tests that are involved in working on jQuery. Because as you may have noticed, a constant theme, there's more than just code. Uh, so I have this whole setup working on my machine, and I'm able to go to local.contribute.jQuery.org, which is um, my site. And I have a clone of the contribute.jQuery.org repo. And I let's say we have this community page, right? And it talks about how can you contribute to the community? What an awesome question to be asking. Um, so we obviously have support and coming to conferences, meetups, speaking, writing plugins. But let's just say I wanted to add in some other thing, like uh, living your dreams. So I have a picture. I know I just added this header in. And I have um, a picture here that explains the concept of living your dreams. So all I have to do, if I want to see this locally, is I save. And then I run grunt deploy. And it goes through and make sure that everything that's in your, all your NPM installed modules, the right versions. In fact, it runs so fast that I can't even list it as it runs. So it grunts everything, it lints everything, builds the pages, makes sure everything's kosher, and then sends it up there. So, and then what do you get? Oh my god, you're living your dreams. Ta-da. <laughs> so, but that, that's really exciting though, because the point is, you can do anything. You can go do pastels, and you can like use an icon font where all the icons are rabbits. I, I, you know, Easter theme, obviously. So that's how it feels when you're working locally. But we still haven't filled in all of the dots. So why don't you resume there, Mr. Gonzalez? Uh, so now we have content that can be deployed to WordPress. Um, but how do we manage the WordPress install itself? Right? How do we manage the themes? How do we manage the plugins? Uh, well, the answer to that is a custom WP content setup, uh, which we call jQuery WP content. And for the most part, this is actually just uh, standard WordPress APIs. So we, you know, we, we build regular plugins. Uh, we use MU plugins for a lot of our stuff. We go through all the um, action APIs. And uh, the, the biggest customization that we have, the reason that we need to actually replace WP content instead of just writing a whole bunch of plugins, is uh, Andrew Nason wrote a custom installer for us. And it does auto provisioning of our websites. So anytime we want to add a new site, all we have to do is go into uh, a file called sites.php in this directory. And uh, we just add an entry to an array that's just the title and URL of the uh, new site that we want to launch. And the first time anyone visits any page on that site, it will automatically do the install and then render the page. So we don't actually have any setup. If you wanted to add a new site locally. Farts.jquery.com, uh, for instance. <laughs> you could just add that to the array go to it in your, assuming you already have DNS set up locally, right, if you're editing Etsy host or whatever you're doing. Um, you can just go there, and the site will automatically install itself. You don't have to do any configuration. Uh, so that's what uh, we get with jQuery WP content. Then for our theme inheritance, we just use WordPress's built-in theming system. Uh, there's the ability to have a child and parent theme. So we have a base theme, which is you know, just the general look and feel and all of our branding. And then we, each individual site gets another theme which inherits from the base, and it defines all the site-specific colors and any, anything that, you know, we might do specific for styling. And then uh, it doesn't do multi-level inheritance, so we, we have some, like, tricky things that we do with subdomains, right? Like, so api.jquery.com looks like jquery.com. Uh, but the theme inheritance is really nice. It, it works out well for us. Um, and you know it's great when you're managing 20 sites. 
So getting back to the plugin site, right? So now, now we have the ability to put content up there. Uh, the plugin site's an interesting mix because it's partly static content, like all the docs on how do you publish your plugin and how should you um, build a manifest file. That's all just markdown files sitting in a repo like every other site. But then there's all this dynamic content, like every time someone creates, uh, you know, every time someone wants to publish their own plugin, we need to do that, but that's obviously not going into a markdown file that's sitting in a Git repo. <laughs> so the way this works is we have a node HTTP server running, and it's listening to GitHub post receive hooks. So this actually is referencing something that we haven't talked about yet. Um, <laughs> so, so we listen to the post receive hooks, and then we check for tags. So basically, if you want to list your plugin, all you do is set up a post receive hook that uh, notifies the plugin site. And every time you push, we get notified. We look to see if you have a new tag. If you do, we check if um, the tag is a semantic version. And if it is, then we'll check to see if we've processed it before. If we haven't, we'll check to see if it has a valid manifest file. And if it does, then we'll list it on the plugin site. Yeah. Uh, so, so this process, does, it's a mixture of Grunt jQuery content and Node WordPress. Um, but it's easy for somebody to publish a plugin legitimately, but it's hard for somebody to spam, right? They'd have to go create a, a GitHub account. They'd have to create a repo. They'd have to create a manifest file. They'd have to create a tag. And if they want to continue to spam, they have to keep creating more tags. Um, and it would be very easy for us to stop somebody from doing this, right? Like, we can just blacklist it, somebody. Um, and then we use SQLite as the canonical data store. So every time we process a plugin, we stick it in the SQLite database. And that's the only thing we have to back up. If, this, if the site went away somehow, I don't know how that would happen. Um, I don't either. <laughs> but if the site went away, we could just run through this database, rebuild all the pages, and everything would be back. So uh, now we have something that would work on my machine. <laughs> but but how, how are we going to show it to people, right? In order to get it into your eyes, we need to host it on a web server. And being fairly new to the concept of hosting something using WordPress, I usually tried to avoid it myself. I uh, decided to ask Nason for his opinion on what we should use. Um, he came back and he said, you definitely need to use Nginx and PHP FPM. So using these two packages is a lot better than using Apache for your PHP hosting. Um, and it makes a huge difference, uh, especially when you think about the caching layer. So Nginx allows you to do this thing called fast CGI cache, where every page that would normally be sent to PHP is going to be checked in a cache that it keeps for itself. It's kind of like varnish in front or something like that. But Nginx has it built straight in. And with a couple of lines of code, we are able to save ourselves a lot of load. And I know that this works because I forgot to turn it on originally. <laughs> so <clears throat> we were deploying a couple of sites, right? And for the first few sites, we, we had no problems. It ran fine, the load went well. And then suddenly we move api.jquery.com over. And that's probably, or is our most busy, most trafficked website. And when API got on there, the machine load went crazy. You couldn't hit a page. It took three seconds to load. And then Nason came around and was like, oh, you didn't actually turn on the caching. <laughs> and I was like, oops. <laughs> so we turn this on, and the load times immediately go back Everything is great, so it works really well. I highly suggest you look into this. It's a technique called microcache, um, if you want to look for some blog posts on it. So some numbers, just to prove that this works. Um, we do this all from one public-facing web server. So there is only one machine that runs WordPress in our entire infrastructure, and per hour it serves somewhere between 30,000 and 100,000 page views. And I'm not talking about JavaScript files, just WordPress pages. Um, that amounts to about 1.6 million page views per day. So that also amounts to approximately three terabytes of traffic a month. So it, it, it's not a small <laughs> amount of traffic that we're serving from this server. So in order to get these servers set up, we have to have some sort of configuration management. Um, we use a package called Puppet. There's other ones out there. Chef, I believe, is one that I've been hearing a lot about lately. Um, but what this allows you to do is write some simple scripts and some simple modules that you can reuse in order to control the configuration of your servers. 
To set up a new domain, anyone who's ever worked with uh, servers know you have to set up a virtual host, you have to set up this, you have to set up that. Puppet allows you to write a couple of lines, make it really easy. And as soon as we deploy changes, we have a script that listens and monitors and updates things. So this also gives us the ability to recover very easily in case somebody accidentally deletes something. We have the ability, <laughs> we have the ability to build another server very quickly from this Puppet template. And in fact, we know this works because I use a package called Vagrant as well, um, which allows you to spawn up an instance of your virtual config. So when I'm testing something new for the plugins or for the plugin site or whatever, I actually just spawn a copy of the jQuery web server on my local machine using Vagrant and Puppet. And it comes across very quickly. Um, so these two lines here at the bottom, uh, this is just a little bit of what Puppet looks like. This one's really simple because the defaults work for contribute. Um, there's a couple of points where you can add some things, whatnot, but this site updater is really interesting. So this is really the last piece of the puzzle that makes everything work really well for us. So we wrote this little, or Scott wrote this little package called node get notifier, which basically listens for post receive hooks from GitHub. It gets a notification on every push, every tag, every time you do anything. And you can listen for these events using services in Node. And on top of that, we've built Node Notifier Server, which basically listens for a event from the post receive hook and then launches a shell script to do whatever you need to do. So in this case, when a commit happens to the plugin site, it tells the plugin's site updater to Hold the new code in, run grunt deploy, push it out to the main or to the staging server. Anytime something gets pushed to master, it gets pushed to our staging server. Anytime something gets pushed to a tag, it gets pushed to the live server. So it's very easy for us to maintain our websites. It also gives us built-in protection from Adam and spam. Um, you know, Adam's very, very talented at deleting things. So <laughs> The plugin site, which we all hated, so I'm glad it's gone, but he, he, he did a very good job of killing it. <laughs> we also have this library that you might have heard of called jQuery that people use. Um, and this is uh, really interesting because you need something to test the libraries too, right? So we have continuous integration using Jenkins. There's other packages here again. Travis uh, comes to mind. Um, what this does is it listens for us to push code to GitHub, it builds the library, it runs the testing using Grunt, and it'll take that build as soon as it passes Grunt and uploads it to the CDN for, for the people who want to be on the bleeding edge of testing things in JS Fiddles. You can use the git build to make sure that things will work in the absolute newest code. Um, it also uploads a build to a service that we've written called TestForm. Um, that what that does is um, it just has a list of browsers and a list of unit tests and it makes a nice little grid and you point a bunch of browsers at it and it runs all the unit tests. And the problem is, is that you need a bunch of browsers to point at it and in order to get that we use a service called Browser Stack and we also wrote some node packages which are linked here in the slides um, to get you to be able to spawn workers in Browser Stack um, just based on what test swarm is needing. So now whenever you push a build, it gets tested, it gets uploaded to the CDN, it's great, works out really well. But how do we know that all of these things are working? Yeah, so um, we've got all this infrastructure, we've got all these sites, uh, it's really great. Um, but it's uh, you know, a challenge to always keep everything running. Um, and you know, it's one thing to be retroactive um, but you know it's best to be proactive. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so first of all, we've got um, you know a lot of data. Uh, if you're running your own website um, and you find out that there's a problem on it, uh, someone might call you up. They say they're getting some database errors. You can easily go through your logs and probably grep for the issue. Um, but that doesn't scale very well, especially when we've got you know volunteer hours. Um, going towards this, and uh, so you know it's 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 difficult to scale that. So we use a tool called Splunk um, to uh, help us identify issues. Uh, so 
we are taking in one megabyte per second of data, uh, machine-generated data. What that means is, you know, log files. Um, the machine-generated data, or the log files, come from various sources. Um, all of our tools spit out the logs, and then we ingest them. Um, so here we have uh, the dashboard showing us um, the status of our test swarm and uh, continuous, integra continuous integration uh, stack. Um, so when we first deployed this, uh, we were noticing we had problems. Uh, browsers were not running all the tests, uh, which is not good, and it was very uh, difficult to troubleshoot. Uh, so we built this, um, and it's also good to have for other reasons. It's interesting. Um, you can see here uh, the number of workers that have been spawned uh, today. Um, this is a pretty quiet day, obviously. Normally, this is uh, a lot fuller. We're spawning you know, hundreds of browsers a day on a busy day, um, and this lets us keep track of that. Uh, so you can see the workers uh, spawn, terminate. Uh, a termination happens when the worker uh, is idle and it's finished running tests. Uh, the worker doesn't know that it's done. We can't shut down the worker from the browser, obviously. Uh, so we have to call another API uh, endpoint and say shut down. Um, down here, uh, can you all guess which browser takes the longest time to run? <laughs> um, and it's interesting, though, it's IE7. Uh, you would think maybe IE6, although maybe we're not testing IE6 now. Not, as, not, not for as many things. Yeah, so anyways, and we do... Seems, seems to be, uh, there seems to be some problems uh, with IE7. Uh, and so this tool is helping us troubleshoot that. Um, so the, yeah, there's, br there's browser stack dashboard. Um, and so I'll move on to uh, another uh, item that we uh, monitor, which is the download builder. I'm sure you've all used this. Uh, it lets you package the um, components that you want and uh, also uh, pick the theme and even create a custom theme and uh, you hit download, that gets um, built on demand every time. Uh, you know, we could maybe uh, improve that process, but that's what it does for now. And, and we don't have a reason to improve that process. Uh, you know, we might just go off and uh, intuitively try to improve that process and cache these packages, but why bother if it's not uh, causing a burden on our uh, infrastructure? Um, and so that's what this shows us. Um, you know, we can see the average build time, um, stuff like that. Uh, anyways, let me start off at the top. Uh, so up here, you can see um, this uh, shows us, it's not all time, as it says, all time downloads, that's incorrect. Uh, it's, it's all time since time began, which was about eight months ago when jQuery 1.9 was released, and we released this new download builder. Um, and so you can see we've got over two million downloads in the last, um, eight months. Uh, these are the quick downloads, so you can see most people prefer to package their own. Um, and then we've got all time downloads per version. And this is a really interesting graph. Uh, it shows us um, that when we release a new version, the cutover is very quick. Uh, with the exception of, you can see 1.9 is just trickling along here, uh, because past that we deprecated some features, and so some people are uh, sticking to that. Um, what else is on here? Uh, so. This gives us some insight into you know, um, the average uh, build time. Uh, if someone's doing some malicious stuff, we'll see spikes here. Uh, perhaps uh, it's due to another anomaly. Um, so we just keep an eye on that. Uh, this shows us uh, the common bundles. So uh, take my word for it, this scrolls off the page, but uh, this is every single bundle, every single component. Uh, so most people actually just grab everything. Um, but they do want a custom theme, so uh, they still, you know, can't just use the everything quick download. Uh, and you can see which themes are most popular here. Um, most people either use the default lightness or uh, roll their own. And then we have the top components, um, which is, uh, these are pretty intuitive. Obviously, core is going to be the most popular. Um, and then, you know, here's date picker, and every item previous is a dependency for date picker. <laughs> um, this is an interesting little uh, chart. I built this uh, around Christmas. I was wondering, um, you know, how busy the Christmas season is for developers. Um, and you can see uh, per day uh, the busiest uh, hour. So it's interesting here uh, at approximately 2 o'clock uh, West Coast time, um, it looks like that was the busiest hour. Uh, people hit their stride at uh, Monday 
at, uh, at, at uh, 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, after lunch. Um, here's, uh, so moving on, um, here is uh, not all of the sites, but uh, all the main ones, and it just shows uh, the number of page views per, or f over the last 24 hours. Um, so you can see people love their docs, um, you know, figuring out what to do. Uh, so this is the last uh, 24 hours. Um, uh, we got jQuery UI here and jQuery.com. Um, so yeah, that you can see, you know, uh, what time of day is uh, the busiest. And then people break and go home for work, or I mean, go home from work and uh, yeah, finish off their day. Uh, moving along, uh, the last thing I'm gonna show you all is uh, something I hope that one day your names will be on. Um, this shows uh, the GitHub repos and uh, the number of commits. Uh, so on the left side is all time commits and on the right side is the past 30 days. Um, so here we're looking at api.jquery.com. Um, you can see the, uh, you know, this just stacks over time. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's a cumulative. A cumulative. Um, and then, uh, so we have jQuery. Uh, you can see jQuery core has got quite a bit of other contributors. Um, so that's good to see. Uh, hopefully that number, you know, increases over time. Um, you can see John Resig, although he doesn't commit anymore, uh, he left his mark. <laughs> um, and at jQuery UI, you can all guess who is the main contributor there. Um, Paul keeps going. And uh, yeah, that's uh, all I got. Um, hopefully uh, you all will uh, show up here one day. Um, so we, as you can see, we've got a lot of data here. Um, there's only so much we can do to analyze it. We've got limited resources. Um, if anybody in here is interested in the data, um, just speak to me. Uh, I can get you access to this, and uh, I'd love to have you crunch some numbers. Thanks. So, as you can see, um, we obviously have a lot of data, but some of the numbers are much bigger than others. Uh, when you look at the number of people who are on our website at any given time or downloading UI, it's like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions we're talking about. Then we get into like contributors and it's like, oh, there's like a couple hundred. Um, then it's like contributors to docs and it's like, a, like tens, like multiples of 10, but like it gets smaller and smaller. So, Obviously, a major impetus behind doing all this work was making something awesome so that people can help us. So how is a great way, how to, con <laughs> what's a great way to contribute? Obviously, the easiest thing to do when you're getting started is to file issues. You know, people always come, they come to jQuery conference, they come on the internet, and they're just like, how do I contribute to jQuery? Should I just pick the hardest IE bug and just solve it myself? Uh, <laughs> and the answer is yes, that's a great way to start. But most people, that's not actually a good place to start. It's like the opposite of a good place to start. Uh, so filing issues on anything where you find something wrong, go to the repository, say that you found something wrong. Make a fix, make an improvement or actually set this whole thing up locally. Give us feedback on how it felt to set it up locally. Uh, was it horribly difficult or was it um, smooth as a baby's bottom? And you know, go to the contrib contribution hub and read more. And the most important thing is actually to just be present. I think that a lot of people don't realize that open source projects happen every single day on the internet. Uh, People are just in IRC communicating with each other and there's you know, narratives. It's like, oh, the last two weeks were full of it and people don't, aren't necessarily sensitive to that. And all of a sudden when they do become sensitive to that, that's when you start to feel like you're involved in a project because you feel like you are part of a team. So, but what should I help with? Anything. Um, Obviously, we just started the learning site, which is new and big. It uh, was based on jQuery fundamentals, uh, but it's been expanding. But there's a ton, ton more. It's kind of designed to be this compendium of information that goes beyond the documentation. 
Uh, people love getting features into jQuery. I think people are always like, yo, I got this great idea. And Dave's always like, no. <laughs> and then if they get Dave to say yes, Scott's like, no. <laughs> but I uh, like on. <laughs> and if it, if it manages to land, Adam might delete it. <laughs> exactly. So the thing is, if you want to get features into jQuery, a great place to do that is in docs and content and design. Um, so we're welcome, we welcome that. Plugin registry, we, obviously it's up on its legs, but we could, we want to add more services to it. We want to add more metrics. Um, other things that are on the docket, we, you know, we're not doing everything perfectly with jQuery WP content yet. We want to imp, uh, get Grunt involved there so that we can serve minified and concatenated JavaScript and CSS. Um, from the big to the small across all of, of jQuery, Beyond just code, there's plenty, plenty, plenty to dig in. And the reason, really, that we decided to get these flows working is because another big barrier to contribution in open source is that the problem that you're solving is typically the hard thing, and you already know the open source stuff. Or you're new to open source, and you want to solve an easy problem, but the hard part is like, ah. Oh, I, everyone keeps telling me about Git, but like, I don't know. <laughs> so it, we wanted to create workflows whereby people could be empowered to do things that they're good at, you know, write markup, uh, improve docs, you know, find errant commas, translate things into other languages, um, just make things look better, make things look better on the iPad, make things look better on iPad mini, uh, you know, so on and so forth. D their strong suit, pair it with doing open source workflows, and then you can learn those workflows while being uh, useful. So goals to wrap up, we wanted to encourage active development. I think we've done that, um, but it can get more and more active. We wanted to increase our collaboration and make it easier for people to contribute, and then just simplify our own deployment workflows because it was a complete clusterfuck before. And now it is not. And then, like I was saying, to make these things feel like writing code, uh, working in your editor, committing, uh, having merge conflicts with other people's work, communicating with them about problems, just make everything else feel like writing code. Um, we have a couple minutes for Q&A. I also have one potentially fun demo. Um, we could probably do them simultaneously. Uh, so who wants to merge a pull request and push it live to a jQuery site while we do Q&A? Yeah. yeah! OK, great. So um, I'm going to do that. And Gislaine will manage our Q&A running around. So if you have questions, uh, please ask away. And we'll also do some changes. Anybody? Anybody? Any question about any talk at any point today? <laughs> there we go. Are you going to put all the slide decks from all the talks in one place? Nope. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are going to take, as we, as we collect the slide decks, we're going to get that stuff back into the event site. So where normally there's just a schedule, we'll just get the slide link into there so that you can enjoy with your teammates and families and pets. Huh? Almost every presenter shares their slides. Right, guys? Of course. Um, I'm going to keep doing this little demo thing. Um, anything else? Anything else? So did you consider using GitHub pages for hosting all the content? Or is, that, is it too that much? Like that? Is it too many people going there per day? One or? word answer. Um, <laughs> GitHub pages has no features. Gotcha. So, <laughs> uh, it, I, well, it's true. So if you, if you go back to the slide about what features WordPress has, WordPress is a content management system, and GitHub is Host my HTML. Sure. Right? Do you something so, like so OctoPress? We would, maybe? we would be building a CMS for ourselves if we were using GitHub pages. So, 
yeah, there's definitely a, a kind of a narrative here, um, which is that I, when we started this, I was like, yo, we got to use Jekyll, because that shit's rad. Um, and I, so I was trying to do that in parallel uh, with this work. Um, but it turns out things like search are a huge pain in the ass on top of Jekyll. Things like theme inheritance, when you all of a sudden have 20 static sites instead of one, uh, don't really scale up. Or they do. And people have solved these problems not using WordPress, but they're not, they weren't helping. <laughs> so you know, you gotta, you got to ride the ship you have, right? Rot. <laughs> I think. <laughs> was that was that Alex telling you that that wasn't a thing? That was not a thing. It is now. <laughs> well, we have uh, we don't have time to do this swanky ass demo, uh, but believe it or not, there's an extra semicolon somewhere um, in some of our documentation, and that guy hasn't signed the CLA yet anyway. Um, anyhow, one last question. Make it a good one. Yes, there is alcohol at the party tonight. Um, <laughs> no, there, there's a real question over there. Adam. Where? Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, following up on my question um, for Dave from earlier, um, I noticed that you're using Splunk and tracking the number of downloads overall of the various versions of jQuery. Is there any kind of overall tracking between usage on the, the CDNs and the usage on, that you're getting from Splunk? So that's one thing we want to get in there is the CDN uh, traffic. Um, the CDN providers we have right now uh, aren't as forthcoming as a commercial CDN provider. Uh, so maybe one day. Adam, uh, Corey, you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, basically, we would love to have those stats. We want to see them, too. Um, it's something we're working on. It should be coming soon. So we hope that you found today invigorating and edifying. Uh, those are all, we hope it was good. Um, uh, anyhow, we have a party here tonight sponsored by Jive. It's in two hours. There are going to be uh, light appetizers and such and such. But if you are craving like a Bloomin' Onion or six, um, go to the Outback Steakhouse. I don't know where it is here. I assume there is one because we're in America. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, we're in Portland. It would be a local version. Um, we'll see you back here at 8. I think there's also Manny Petty's going on downstairs. It's 7 <laughs> to 8 um, in the breakout rooms, uh, in case you really feel like breaking out. Um, <laughs> that's one thing to do. We'll see you back here tonight, or we'll see you tomorrow. The first talk is at 10 AM. Thank you very much. <laughs>